Hi, I'm Steve Smith with Growth Source Coaching in Lake Forest, California, and I want to welcome everyone to today's Business Transformational On Air. Um, I'm a business coach, and I work with commercial shipping companies like logistics companies, freight forwarding, other transportation firms to help their owners, the decision makers, tune themselves up professionally so they can grow their businesses more successfully. And uh, today, we're going to take you through an actual live uh, case study, if you will, with a client who's done very well under this system. So I want you to listen really close, take great notes, because I think it's going to be to your benefit. Um, today we're going to be introducing a gentleman named Eric Hinson. He's a managing partner for a company that's located in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, called Logistics Worldwide. Uh, and Eric came with all of the usual things that business owners struggle with, and you're going to hear his story and figure out how he got his way out of it. Now, I'd also like to introduce uh, the host. Uh, the gentleman's name is Frank Kletzitz, and he is with Viral Marketing. And uh, Viral Marketing is helping bring these events to you so you can see all of us live, up close, and in person. Uh, and I'm going to turn this over to Frank here in just a moment. Uh, but once you're, once you're finished with this, this broadcast, if you find yourself sitting in these very same situations and your business is not moving forward before, because of it, I would really encourage you to reach out and have a conversation with me to see how I can help you get what you're going to find out Eric got from the very same program. So uh, welcome again. Enjoy the, uh, in the interview. And uh, Frank, let me turn it over to you. Great. Well, thanks for the uh, wonderful introduction, Steve. And it's a pleasure to be able to help you put these on, and let's get to you, Eric. So, Eric, can you explain the situation you found yourself in when uh, you, you knew you needed to get some help? What happened? What, what situation were you in? Can you describe that as much as you can uh, so our viewers can be relate to the situation that you were in at that time? Basically, I had a business that ha had been in business for about six to eight months, maybe a year. Where I found myself was the business had some growth. We were losing money every month. And there were some struggles that were just wearing me down. I was working 90 plus hours a week, frustrated because we couldn't seem to make any headway. Uh, it was difficult to gather clients, to get new clients. It was uh, difficult to actually approach clients. It was actually to give them an indication that we were a serious distribution company. And, and in speaking with someone one day at a, at, at a conference one day, somebody posed the question to me, you know, what are you doing about it? And I said, well, I'm working harder. And he said, you need a business coach. I said, what are you, crazy? I've been in, I've been in this industry 20 years or 15 years. Um, why do I need a business coach? And he said, because somebody who's a business coach looks from the outside and can help you. So I began to do some research, and I put it off for a couple months. And basically, through a couple of different connections, I got hooked up with Steve. And that's about four years ago. And since then, it's been quite different, a dramatic change in specifically me and second of all, the business. So what was your what was your daily life like when you were at the stressed out the most? What were you doing and knowing now maybe what were you doing wrong? Well, a lot of these things that I'll tell you I was doing wrong. Basically, what I would do is I was uh, I'd get up early. I'm an early bird. I get up four o'clock in the morning. I'd be in the office at five o'clock in the morning, five thirty, and I'd get to work. And we have international clients. We deal with clients all over the world. We've got U.S. clients and international clients. So I would start emailing, start phone calling conference calling for my clients um, that were in-house working with them. The biggest problem that I actually struggled with was I was trying to be the guy that's building the business, that's directing the business, but at the same time I had an operation that was trying to deliver products for our clients. We're basically a third-party distribution company, so we receive the client's products, we manage it within the house, and we ship it out to their either end user or to the retailer. What I found myself doing is functioning as the guy on the floor, the supervisor, the manager, the salesman, and the managing partner. And so what actually happened was after, as I said, six, eight months, a year of working constantly during the week and then every weekend, the frustration level increased because we were basically doing more. We weren't gaining any headway. And, um, and, and my controller says to me all the time, with all the work we're doing, what are we taking home in the cigar box at the end of the month? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and so then I began to do the research after this gentleman. He's, he'd been an older gentleman said, uh, said, you need a coach. I started looking into it, and through a, different, a couple of different people, I got connected with Steve. And uh, 
we had our first conversation, and it was a nice conversation. And I told him what's going on until he started asking me questions and made me feel quite uncomfortable because it was embarrassing, some of the questions he asked, and I didn't have an answer because I didn't really have a handle on what I should be doing, what the business should be doing, and, and, and an understanding of why we weren't going anywhere. And those are what I like to transition to is let's hear some of those questions. When you were on that first call, could you maybe re-rehearse that call a little bit? I'd love to hear it. Uh, what were some of the first questions you asked to identify the problem, Steve? He said, oh, go ahead. Steve, you want to do it or me? Uh, well, typically after we get through a lot of the detail to understand kind of your, your current condition, the lay of the land, uh, some of the things I like to ask people is, okay, you, you're not happy with where the business is now for a lot of reasons. What do you want from the business? Where do you want the business to go? And, and that's tough for folks that are like Eric, who are very involved in the operations, because that's his experience. That's, that's the area where he's comfortable. He knows what he's doing. And when you're down in the weeds, it's real hard to look over the treetops and say, that's where we want to go. And, and those are the kind of questions that usually cause people to, to kind of sit back in their chair and think, wow, I don't have an answer for that. What were, what were some other hard-hitting questions that uh, he asked you, Eric? <laughs> the first question, uh, that, that question right there was, was telling because my, I think my answer to that was I want to make profit this month. And he said, well, okay, we've <laughs> no got some work to do. And uh, the second question he asked me is what are you doing with your time? And I said, what, do you, what am I doing with my time? I had no idea where I was spending my time. So he had me for two weeks, which was a pain in the behind, to write down every 15 minutes what I was doing. And it was incredibly telling. Because when I took two weeks, basically we, we had a call in two weeks, and in looking at where I was investing my time, I was spending approximately 5% of my time prospecting. I was spending about 60% of my time on administrative activities, which were low value, and then the rest of it was spent communicating with very little effect. So what happened is I wasn't leading the business at all. I was basically in the weeds dealing with the day-to-day -day things that actually are necessary, but I was not the best person to do it. So I wasn't really, I wasn't really doing anything that I'm the only one that should be doing. What other problems did you see in his business, Steve? Um, one of the things that I find quite frequently uh, to varying degrees, and Eric certainly had to deal with this as well, was who is your best client? Who are the companies that you want to represent because what they want out of a third-party logistics company and what you do better than anybody else is a great match as opposed to just whoever calls up and asks for a quote. And I mean, we all go through that, but there wasn't a lot picking and choosing and as a result Eric was working very hard to please people whose who's, what they were asking for and what they were willing to pay was not producing a lot of profit. Okay. Eric, what would you say, would you say about that? Because I know that uh, uh, in trying to figure out who you really wanted to serve, who you thought you were good at and some of the folks that you were working with at that time, uh, it, it, they, there wasn't a real good match there. There was not a good match at all, Steve, and, and what we went through early was we began to take a look at all the clients we had on board at the time and all the prospects we were looking at. We actually try to focus on providing what we call value add, and in this industry, you've, if you're selling a widget, you have to produce the widget, you ship it to the U.S., you have it distributed to your, to your client. Basically, what happened is if, you're using, if you have a commodity widget, there's not a lot of value in that. And we're looking to add value. We're looking to help their supply chain. We're looking to help them as an international client understand how to set up in the U.S. And we're actually looking at how can we make the most effective use of the resources you have. For instance, working capital tied up in inventory. That's something that's critical. How fast do you turn it? How do you move it? How do you deliver to the clients? How do you make the retailers ecstatically happy with the, with the experience they have? That's what we wanted to sell. The clients that we had on board, for the most cases, we're looking at what is my lowest price because they're not in a marketplace that allows the type of margin to where they actually recognize the value you're trying to provide. So we're basically throwing out a great deal of value that, that, that had no relevance to the clients we had and were pursuing.
Okay. So we took a step back and said, what do we want to, who do we want to be, which is a very difficult question because you said, I'm in the weeds. What am I? I'm the supervisor. I'm driving a forklift today. What is our ideal client? What is the ideal, you know, what is their revenue? What is their, what is their product mix? What is, where, what is their, uh, you know, what channels are they moving through? These type of things we had to take a look at. And what we found is we were marketing to the wrong client and we were sending the wrong message. And that's really what got it started. So what would you say that once you identify that there were these challenges in your, in your business and you were doing you know, the jack of all trades, the master of none, mm -hmm. they would say, what would you say, let's go through maybe the top three biggest changes that you made in your business with Steve. Let's go one by one of what those changes were, what you did, and I want to really hear the story of the breakthroughs and the barriers we had to, that we had to break down in order to attain them. So what would you say is the one biggest thing that you, you learned from Steve that you had to implement? Let's talk about that. I would say the one thing that I had to implement, which was quite frankly the hardest, was me going from really being the boss or the quarterback where I was involved in everything that happened. I was involved in most decisions. People looked to me. I mean, I'd been in the industry for a long time, so yeah, they looked to me. It felt really good to be the answer man. But what I recognized was the business keyed off of me. And I heard clients say before, this business is Eric. And that's not a healthy situation to be in. Moving from being the quarterback or being the boss to being the coach and the leader was probably the number one thing that I had to step through personally. Forget professionally. Personally, I had to be okay with not being involved in everything and actually freeing my time up as I said before, you saw how my time was, was diluted incredibly poorly. For me to step back and become the coach and the leader, because you can't be the quarterback and be the coach of the team. You can't be the guy that says, I want this business not to be a half million. I want it to be two million, and I want to actually make a profit. But how do we do that? Which clients do we have to approach? I had to step back and allow the team to make decisions. What I actually had to do, and Steve had to help me through this, was I had enabled a group of people that depended on me for every decision. So I couldn't simply walk away because if I walk away, they would be completely lost. So we actually had to go through a process where I became a coach, I became a mentor, and I became an accountability person that said, I'm not going to answer this question. You have to go back and give me your your recommendations and solutions and I'll help you through the first two or three decisions. Then it comes to you tell me what happened, you tell me the decision, you tell me the results. And that was a huge step personally for me because I had always been the guy that was the answer man. I would say that one step right there is probably one of the keys that I didn't believe. Even when Steve told me at first, I didn't really believe it. And quite frankly, I was skeptical. But let's, go said, let's go deeper on that, Steve. I want to talk about when someone is the one minute manager, everyone says, do you have a minute? Do you have a minute? Yes. How do you break out of being the one minute manager? You just don't say stop now and go do this. There's probably a process involved. It, there there is. And, and the process starts by recognizing that not only can you not be the answer man for everything and, and be the person that, that, that handles everything, it's not healthy for your business. If you've gone to the trouble of hiring good people, qualified people, intelligent people that are closer to the particular area of the business, whether it's the finance or the billing or the client experience or the guy that's running the floor, um, you have to learn how to let them do their jobs and be an advocate on your behalf as opposed to bringing what I call, they bring the monkey. They bring the monkey to you and they say, you know, I've got this monkey and, and I, I need to figure it out so I'm going to put it on your desk and let you handle it. And then Eric was just saying, bring all the monkeys because I'm the monkey master. I had and monkeys all over me. That happens. And, and it's, you know, it feeds the ego, granted. Everybody has that to deal with. But it really does the organization a disservice because while you're in the weeds handling all of this stuff, you're not, you're not at the helm directing where the ship's going. And, and so what I have to help people do is figure out, number one, that is happening. And number two, what is your real role as the owner, the partner, the decision maker of the business? And for most people, the real role is to figure out how to drive revenue through the company, which is sales and marketing. And that's where a lot of folks that are in operational backgrounds or, or more of these kind of industrial business, they're not comfortable in that area. So they do everything they possibly can to keep going in that direction. It's a great segue. Is, so you had to – now, did you hire a quarterback to replace you, Eric? 
So you can become the coach? Actually, or you get the team to self-manage. I got the team to self-manage. In fact, I'll give you an example. This is the first year that I've hired a skilled outside qualified operations manager. And as Steve and I have talked about it for a couple of years, I probably needed that position to be filled for a couple of years. But I ended up – now, we added a couple of people, but we did not add a high-level uh, operations manager until this year. Basically, what happened is we had to build a self-directed team, and it took some time. And it took some challenges, but again, with a small business, you don't always have the money to go out and just – I think a lot of people may think, well, if I need to step back and be the, the leader, the CEO, the president, or whatever, I just need to bring in a team of people that I can't afford. We didn't have the money either. We couldn't do that, so we had to actually develop – we didn't have any money. We had to develop a self-directed team, and, and granted, we had missteps. We had errors. We had problems. We had personnel issues. We had to replace people, and those are very unpleasant things to do. But I began to recognize that if we were going to move in the right direction, the first thing we had to do was get the team on board and actually have them start making their own decisions, and in a lot of cases, better than I made anyway because I knew the details of what was going on. But it took several years before this was the first year we've hired an outside person. I've been very fortunate, very blessed to find somebody that's got about 20 or 30 years in, in the business who's completely taken over the operation for me now and completely freed me from most everything except metric evaluation and, and discussions and meetings. And originally, so, yeah. Frank, yeah. Frank, let me jump in on that because based on what you just heard him say, that's where the real learning is. Eric bought into the process. He understood that his ability to grow his entire company, be better, faster, more in line with pricing in the market and still make a profit, was highly dependent upon him tuning up the rest of his team. He bought into that process and he started in a very regimented, planned out pace, he started to let go. It took some time and it was not easy, but it, it, it has to happen if you want to really be, and I get back to a comment I said earlier, I don't want to just be a warehouse. I wanted to be a serious player in the, in the third party market, and in order to do that, I had to make some changes that quite frankly were uncomfortable that in, in, and in a lot of cases my team was not comfortable and still not necessarily comfortable for but as we begin to see results then what happens is you begin to believe it but it takes a tremendous amount of work is none of this is easy and I'll tell anybody that's considering this it's not easy but I will tell you one thing it's a lot easier than the alternative which is to continue, <laughs> continue to struggle where we were well, I can great. actually take a vacation now <laughs> you, know, you were able to self-direct the team and you know we don't have to go much more into that but you knew that you had to throw the problems back to the people to solve them, basically you answering them. Absolutely. I had to push them and by, back. And by, 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 by doing that and maybe separating yourself and all those things that Steve coached you on, you're able now to focus on where the money is made, is in That's the money right. getting, which is the, the, the selling of the service instead mm -hmm. of the providing of it. Exactly right. And let's now transition into that breakthrough. Now, would you call yourself a sales guy, Eric? I actually have done sales in the past, but I was a technical salesperson. So it's back to the the comfort level that I had is is when in my first when I first got out of college I was a technical salesperson, and that's great because you know I can sell to a bunch of engineers. What was happening is I realized as I now that I look back 15, 20, 25 years that in essence what I was doing is I was selling to a bunch of technical guys that weren't the decision makers. What we're selling here is a service that has to have a decision made, and in most cases this is a very important decision to a client or a customer who's looking to penetrate the market with his product. Going to a third party route and turning over number one your assets which is your inventory and number two the management of that to allow them to go sell their business is quite a step and so what I'm doing now is quite differently. I'm selling to the leaders of a business. I'm selling to the decision makers. When I'm just selling a component to an engineer not quite the same Depth How big are the necessary. companies, Eric, that you're selling to? How many people are there, met revenue? Just give us an idea of the accounts you have to break into. In general, what we had started with was we had a couple of large clients that may have been a couple, three, four, five million dollars a year in revenue on their product side when there was, they sell their product. Um, we also had a lot of companies that were $100,000, and we initially thought that our, our range of clients was between $50,000 and, and, and a million or two million in terms of the, mar the target market we were looking for. What we've really identified now is that if a client's not five to ten million, they are not going to understand the value of the services we're providing 
because they're not going to have the cash flow, they're not going to have the revenue stream, they're also not going to have the product base to understand the dynamics of what our best value is. A lot of our clients now are between 20 million and 80 to 100 million right now in terms of annual annual revenue from their sales in the US. Good for you. So the one thing that that we are looking to do now is is as this marketplace is changing, uh, you may you may have heard some some terms in the marketplace, multi-channel or omni-channel fulfillment, and basically this is the Amazon effect. There's so many people that are wanting to buy direct and have it shipped to their home. The whole model of distribution has been changing over the last five to eight years. What we're really looking to do now, we're not competing against Amazon. They have their own model, but what we're looking to do is find that client who may be an underdog in the marketplace and we can give them a competitive advantage because we can provide services that they can't afford to do on their own. Now, when you look at those guys, those guys are between 20 and 150 million in annual revenue. And you would be surprised that clients and customers that have that much revenue a year would look to outsource what we do. But they've determined that it is still a great value to have the experts. They will focus on manufacturing, design, selling, and we focus on the middle part. Okay, and so that's, wanna, we, that's that's fantastic. I want to get deeper into how you got those accounts. And we'll let everyone know, Joan, this is going to be recorded. You had the you asked the question, so at the very end, you can press play and watch the recording. And Bill, we'll get to your question here, you know, very shortly. But I think it'd be great as Steve, can you maybe share with us how you help a technical salesperson? <laughs> land 50 to 100 million dollar accounts? Uh, you know, surprisingly, it's not based on some sales formula, if you will. Selling, the majority of selling, quite honestly, is what goes on in your head. Are you comfortable making those contacts with people that you know, if they only knew you better and knew what your company did, would be willing to do business with you? The one thing that was great about Eric was he's very congenial. It's very easy to get to know. There, there's nothing that he does that, that puts people off, which can be very difficult to overcome early on in the relationship building process. But um, all I ended up telling Eric was, look, the best thing you could do was stand, spend most of your time outside of your office. And that was one of his other challenges. Once he got his operation set and tuned up and he brought the, the expert in for, to run his operation, now he's sitting there with all this time and he still wants to go back on the floor because that's his comfort zone. It's a tractor and so bait. we had to really talk about how do you how do you start changing your own behavior, your own mental mindset about what you're supposed to do? What do you have to physically do every day? Well, one of the big ones was you got to stop going to the office. You start planning your calendar out of people you're going to meet and see, and you stay out of the office. You stay in in the customer's world because that's what helps you get over that initial hump of and making that contact. Yeah. So basically, I mean, give us an idea of your prospecting schedule. So I would assume, I'm, I'm guessing here, that you just started reaching out cold to potential accounts, trying to find out who your ideal client is. And yeah, I'm how, did gonna, get, I'm gonna, how did you get the appointments? What I basically did, I'll kind of give you an indication. One of the things Steve and I worked on initially was I, when we first started working, I had 64 prospects. And quite frankly, all of them stunk. And when you took a look at it, I mean, they were prospects, but they, you know, they could fog a mirror and they had money. So I was thinking, great, let's let's go after them. What we really did was I was going out and actually selling what I thought was really cool. This is the part of the business that I think is great. And so as we're going through talking to these prospects, I'd go to one after another after another. I will get to your question in a minute. But what we realized, and I'm going after a bunch of guys that aren't interested in what I've got to sell. And Steve's point was, did you ask them what they want? I'm like, uh. Uh, I gave him a really cool folder. <laughs> no, I didn't. I never stopped to ask. This is Eric, Logistics Worldwide. Help me understand where your problems are. Help me understand what you're really struggling with in your place in in, uh, in your distribution right now. We even came up with a question when we have when I have a, a client I meet over the phone or Skype or something like that. We actually have a questionnaire that goes down through about nine or ten questions. And by the time they answer those nine or ten questions, about four of them are going to say the same thing. And I know exactly what I need to sell to these guys. So, it helps so you match the target. message to the need. So Absolutely. that was a big shift putting in the asking questions and need analysis before the present presentation of the solution. Yep. Absolutely. So let's go a little let's let's go a little bit deeper into that because a lot of people will get hung up on, you know, how you built the prospect list, how you reached out to people. Um, anything we can share a little deeper on a, you know, how you shifted your sales presentation, more ahas there? 
Actually, what I did is it, it came back to the questions, but it also came back to uh, and a lot of people call it networking. I call it connecting um, because networking sounds so passe. You hear, give me a business card. That's that's very weak. And one of the things Steve told me when we were talking about because because I'm a member of the chamber and I do things locally. Most of my clients are outside of the outside of the state, outside of the area. What I've done is I've connected through. Um, the uh, the trade trade events we've got uh, the, the Southeastern Warehousing Association International Warehousing Logistics Association I began to meet the key decision makers and quite frankly a lot of my competition when we start talking about things where I'm prospecting with a client that just really doesn't make sense to me well then it, it it doesn't fit our model. Well, I've got five or six other people I know in the industry. I've actually sent them the client said, look, this just doesn't match us. I think it might match you. They're looking for cold storage, for instance. They need frozen food stuff. We don't have frozen food. We've got an ambient warehouse. That's just an example. I'd send them to somebody else. So what began to happen is through these cordial relationships, people began to call us. It also opened areas to, for me to think, wait a minute. In Murfreesboro, what is missing just in this town? Because I've got clients from the UK, I've got clients from China, from uh, from Canada, I've got clients in, in clients in this part of the U.S. So I've got clients everywhere. And then I said, well, what's happening in Murfreesboro? Well, there's a need in Murfreesboro because we've got some automotive manufacturing all around this area. So what we're taking a look now is how can we add the greatest value to some people who might not be a tier one supplier, but they need help. How can we actually approach those guys? And now I'm working with a network to identify about four or five of these guys. And once we identify that, we say, wait a minute, okay, if we want this client, who do we need to be and what do we need to have in place to satisfy this client's needs immediately? And so then we take a look at it and say, wait a minute, we need this. We need this technology. We need this type of function that we don't have, but we'll have in six months. So let's start now. In six months, we'll hit this guy up and we really have what's needed. So you begin the relationship. But to answer your question about how do I find my prospects and leads, it comes from everything from LinkedIn. It comes in from relationships with trade associations. It comes from, quite frankly, referrals. Because the more people I learn and meet with, I meet all of their all their family and everything as we as we get as you start working with a client we get to know them well then they say well they had their business owners or their decision makers and they meet another decision makers I'm having problems you got to give Eric a call well you know he may not remember the kind of name of the company but he said give Eric a call so then you can talk about logistics from that standpoint so it's kind of a it's been an evolution from uh, I think we start off with a single page, half page flyer that Steve ripped apart as soon as I had it done, and and then said because his, well his point was what do you you're not telling me anything he said if I look at this you look like a really cool nice guy there's nothing on here that makes me want to call you, and those are the kind of questions that I get I'm like uh okay uh okay and and, and we we move on from there but those are the type of important questions that we never think to ask ourselves. And that's what's helped evolve the model of our sales process because we now have what I would consider a sales process. Before it was Eric doing this and that. We now actually have what I would consider a sales process and, and Steve helped me go through that. Great. Steve, other breakthroughs that you saw working with Eric when it came to the marketing and the selling of the service instead of the providing it? The uh, I think a big thing for Eric was, and he touched on this, in terms of trying to answer that, that value proposition question. Because Eric is certainly not the only company out there that provides third-party logistics. Uh, the U.S. is a huge market for that, and there's tons and tons of people uh, doing that, that business. But a lot of times for folks like Eric who are really trying to figure out how to break away from the pack, and, and, and position themselves as somebody unique for someone else's specific needs, it's really sitting down and saying, what do we do that's any different? What do we do that people out there, if they knew what we did, they would want it? And once he started to take himself out of the business owner's shoes and literally just walk around his desk and sit where the customer sits and says, okay, what's he? forget about what's important to you. I'm the customer. What's important to me? So these kinds of conversations went away from just me having a service that I want to sell you to me being a consultant to figure out what kind of problems I can help you eliminate because everybody has issues that they would rather get rid of and it's just a matter of being the solution for their problem but that takes a different conversation than most sales techniques allow absolutely did you get any, did you get any sales training Eric any what sales now? training you can share with anybody 
any specific sales training or books you've read or other well, things I mean, to help you with this? I've I've read the typical Brian Tracy. I've I've gone through um, uh, the old most of the old guys. Everything from Seven Habits to to sales training with 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 the, with the different gurus of the industry. What I found was, I mean, and, and they're great. It really gives you some good techniques and some good discipline. What it didn't really provide was how do you structure a sales process. It gives you the steps to take if you're trying to somebody to buy something, and that's 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 all fine and dandy. If you're selling a vacuum cleaner, for instance, that's a little different than selling a service. That is, uh, we actually become uh, uh, almost a fiduciary responsibility party for somebody else's assets and money. We're selling a service that's critical. That is, we are the face of that client's business. If we send you, if you order uh, a lampshade and we send you a chair mat, for instance, you're probably not going to be too happy. And so, so they and, and they don't look back to the third-party distribution company and say, "You guys are a bunch of nuts." They say. Well, I thought you were supposed to send me a lamp, and they look back at the manufacturer. So we are the face of that client. Um, but the sales training, it was it was great in terms that my history. I, I've been I've been doing I guess personal development stuff for quite some time, 15 years or so. And what I found is I never actually had a process to be able to use some of the tools to execute what needed to be done. Okay. And Frank, I mean, you're listening to this just like I am, and all the folks that are that are tied in on the broadcast today. Can you imagine how much different Eric's conversations are with his clients today based on what, what he has done to improve himself and his outlook and his position in his business than it was three or four years ago? He's having a completely different conversation that all helps the client understand how much better their world's going to be if they're just hooked on to the right service provider. And that's a that's a that's a mindset shift of massive proportions because most people that stay inside their business they never start thinking that way. They're too busy thinking about the nuts and bolts around them in their immediate day. And so Eric has done a huge, huge service to himself by really embracing a different way of looking at what he does and how valuable it is to the clients he's talking to. Can I add something here, Steve? This this actually brings yeah. up a point. We had a, a recent prospect we're looking. Of uh, it's a combination Germany and the UK, and we had several conference calls with them. And what we thought was a sticking point with them was um, an inventory sticking point. It was it was an, it was a, when you import duties, you've got import duties and things like that. We thought that there was a problem with their customs brokerage work and how they get the product in here and what's the costing. We thought it was a cost model. What we realized after we asked, because I was kind of stuck because we were trying to say, what is it? We can't seem to get together here. So I just took a step back and actually asked one of uh, a good friend of mine as a CFO and said, I'm missing something here. What I came back, he said, why don't you ask this question? Does it have anything to do with tax? And so I took a step back and actually went to him and said, "Help me understand what's your what's your one sticking point? Are you having problems with taxes internally at your year end?" And he said, "This is exactly what the problem is. The problem had nothing to do with the inventory issues here, nothing to do with crossing the border. It actually had everything to do with something inside his business that I have no impact on, but I can get him in touch with an international attorney we work, uh, a tax attorney that's going to help him fix his problem." And so the problem solved, guess what? We're starting to look at how we can get this product moved in here. And that was all it was. It was not me. I was getting stuck trying to sell him what I thought was important until I stepped back and said, what's happening in your business? And a little bit of advice from a friend I met through somebody else said, ask him about taxes because I don't know anything about VAT in the UK. And that's exactly what the problem was. How does he manage the tax implications in his country when he's selling in the US? Now, I have no clue how to fix that. But I was able to get him in touch with somebody, and that just open the door. So now we're having conversations about how we move product in here. So you covered uh, a lot of the sales jump of you um, connecting, not networking, right? Yeah. Referrals, find, trying to find people that might fit the ideal profile on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. going to events where mm -hmm. it's you, um, you know, basically meeting people. Let's talk about some marketing. I mean, do we have any, uh, any marketing processes that you've implemented as far as um, online, offline, mailers, internet, uh, yes. stuff like that to kind of attract what, more leads yes. versus you out and finding them? 
what we've actually done now is, is, is Steve and I are, are going through a process to where we have the first thing we did, which was the quickest thing and the most effective thing, is once we have the message in place, we've created a flyer and a folder because the majority of the current prospects we get, I end up touching at some point in time, shaking their hand, talking to them on the phone, whether they're international or here. So we have a folder. We call it, we call it our impact folder. And what that is is it gives it gives a very clear and concise message. Here are the five things we do, and here are five questions you should ask yourself. If you have issues with any of these five questions, we can help you solve these problems. So that is a is a it's an impact folder. Now we don't send that out to everybody, but if we have a serious client, we send this to them. It tells them who we are, and actually by this time I've already identified what their what their target what their target is or what their big ticket is, what's their pain point. And then I can actually modify the inside of that folder with different flyers to help them identify the fact that that is a strong point for us. If it's not a strong point, then it may not be a good match. That's one piece. The second piece is our website. Um, <laughs> I, I built the website myself with the help of one, one buddy of mine about five years ago. We've all been there, Eric. It's We've horrible. All it, and, and, and here, here's another thing where, where I keep hearing this. It's a really, it's really nice, and, and, and we get to know a little bit about you. It has absolutely no, no, no foundation in what our new model is, what the business is like, what the concepts are. It's terrible. So we're going through a process of redefining and starting a brand new website. And if we have to spend some money, we got to spend some money. But um, now it's almost like I don't want to tell anybody we got a website. It's so bad. But that's the next process. Is that can actually do some things like we'll have. This one is an informational website. It's actually got pictures of people on there I fired two years ago, um, so it's not up to date. Um, it's a very static, a static website, and we're going to move to a very interactive website where I'm going to be posting blogs, or we're going to have other people, friends of mine in the industry, we can link onto their blogs. We're actually going to have interactive tools where our clients can say, "How do you determine?" the cubic dimensions of a pallet. Well, you have a drop down and you and you do that. Is it important to some people? Yes. Is it not to some people? But it can be useful. We'll have other international tools that you say, hey, here are some questions to ask. Here's what we can do. So we're going to have an interactive website that actually draws them to the website and then the main focus is to call, either have them call us or contact us. Right now we've got this really nice informational website forget the fact that it has absolutely nothing to do with the business now, but it's a nice website and it makes people feel good. But it doesn't make them call, so it's useful. Uh, for... Okay, Does that pretty much sum it up, Steve. <laughs> yeah, that's. I mean, that look and and all of the things we've been talking about here today, Eric. And I really appreciate you being very transparent with a lot of your own development. Uh, but you know, Frank, as you can hear from him, he's he's going from just being a provider of. A, a third-party provider of moving people's merchandise around to actually being an industry consultant, and that takes your entire business up to a whole new level. People look at you completely differently in terms of what they will get by being associated with you when you get out of the nuts and bolts and start providing real, you know, real business value to these folks. Because a lot of times the decisions they have to make before they even call you about your service are maybe what's preventing them from making the call. And so he's gotten really good at asking them questions and getting them to talk about the things that surround the immediate part, that middle part that he plays, so he can help them problem solve other areas of his business. That's great. What else do you plan on working with? Um, where are you headed now? So I say for everyone watching, if I can summarize, is you got out of the quarterback position, you became the coach by building a self-directed team, which eventually led to you be able to replace that an operations manager because you had the money coming in from marketing and sales, which you focused on, exactly right? right? Mm -hmm. Then you focused on how to become a great, effective salesperson and time blocking the time out of the office to do that. I mean, in the beginning, how many how many people were you reaching out to a day? I mean, I'm just curious <laughs> on the on the on the volume of prospecting here you did to get I'm, this thing off the ground. Seriously, I, I was I was literally trying to talk to five to ten people a day, and I was trying to squeeze it into a block right between a 9:30 meeting and between my lunch. And then I had to get back out on the floor and help get the product out. So I was trying to squeeze five to ten calls in a day, and they were in, very ineffective because I was not prepared. I was not calm. I was thinking, oh, gosh, as soon as I get done with this, I got to get back on the floor. So you can imagine what kind of salesman I was or what kind of, um, what kind of uh, I yeah, guess, you're almost trying to get off the ground when you're back to work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So would you make a decision, either come in or don't, so I can get back and push these pallets out? It, yeah. It's that type of mindset. And, and you're, you did ask a question, where are we going next? 
one of the things that I'm really looking at is is now that we we seem to be in a pretty good niche in terms of what our services are providing. What we're finding is that our clients are growing internally, and one of the it's interesting because when you take a look at the the diversification of the business, you take a look at how much does each client represent of your overall revenue, and so when I take a look at them, I say, well, that might be a little more than I want. I'm going to go get somebody else and kind of diversify. You don't want you know key clients that, that make up most of your business. You want six to eight clients that make up a good mix and then you can add them in as you go because you will eventually lose some things either through somebody transitioning. We've had two clients that sold their businesses and, and we helped them transition to their new their new owner so we had to actually move product out of here based on, on, on that. Um, but as you get to a point you start looking at this and what I'm doing now is because our uh, we're fortunate because some of our internal clients are growing so fast they have to bring in bigger and bigger clients to diversify the mix because they're growing. So that's a good quality problem to have. Good problems to have. Good problems to have. And, yeah. and, and in doing so, I'm looking at different markets. For instance, we want to become more than just a 3PL. Like I said, we're actually offering a service where we're going to walk an international client through what kind of business structure. Do you need to operate as a foreign entity? Do you need to operate as a C corporation, an LLC? Now, I'm not doing this. But our accountants are doing this because they've experienced it with all our other clients. You know, what what are the, what are the, some of the things you need to be thinking about? It, and it could be something as simple as: Do you have the stomach for this? Do you have the stomach to put an investment in for three to four months where you're where you're 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 going to be hurting? And then when you hit momentum, it could be like uh, we deal with with all the big retailers: Amazon, Walmart, all these guys. We've seen clients who come in and for three to four months have almost nothing with Amazon and then they'll explode 120, 250. One client's grown 250% with Amazon in a year. Now, they're the big boys, but they also have to have someone who can handle that, which is what we do. But now I'm sitting here thinking as this client continues to grow, he has greater and greater needs. There's some things that we're going to be doing next year which are going to have implications on their, their import duties, financially impactful to our client. Because one of the objectives we have is to make our clients more financially sound in their U.S. business through our services. And in doing so, we have to look at different marketplaces. What can we do to add greater value to our current clients, which can actually give us a competitive advantage for our new clients? we got about uh, 20 minutes left here. Okay. This would be a good time to kind of drill some unique questions and some breakthrough points. Okay. So Bill uh, Bernard asks, how did you overcome someone else, Steve, telling you how to get better at your business, i.e. your ego? Yeah, I guess this question is directed at me. <laughs> um, <laughs> anytime that you start, again, I was, I was, I mean, if you read the E-Myth, I was kind of the typical technician. I was a manager. I was a leader in, in an organization. I've been in this industry for now about 20 years. And I think I know a lot about international trade. I know inter a lot about warehousing. To have somebody who doesn't know my business to ask questions that hurt um, definitely hurt the ego. And one of the things that, that Steve, we had a conversation. You might not remember this, Steve. It's like one of the first conversations we had because it looked. I mean, I felt like the whip puppy after you asked a few questions. He said, "You know what, Eric?" She said, "I'm not trying to 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 make you think that what you're doing is not." Um, what you believe you need to be doing. He said, what I'm trying to help you do is believe that you can make this business what you want it to be, but you've got to go through some pain and you've got to be able to release some things. And some of that is protectionism, some of that is ego, and some of that is recognizing that you don't know everything. And he said, I don't know everything and you don't know everything, but together we can ask the right questions, the hard questions to step through it. And I really look at it because you know when you've got a team that you're leading, um, everybody's got an ego. And me being able to step away from, uh, I know what I'm doing, to, okay, maybe I don't know the best way to do this or the right approach. I did have to step away from my ego, and it was, it was not easy because going from the guy that knows everything to just allowing things to flow and actually allowing people to do something differently was hard. But what it's also done is helped me step through some of the team members we have who have an ego who we are now trying to have more... Um, collaborative work together. So it's actually f moved through. But to answer his question, it was extremely hard. I had to think about it. I mean, I had to pray about it. I had to really think about what have I got to go through here because this is hitting me at the heart. This is not just head. This is in here. And you've got to be vulnerable enough to accept the fact that you don't know everything. That's a good answer. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Um, Steve, let's 
let's kind of, let me ask you this question. If you can sum up your experience with Steve and what he's done for you, what would you tell the audience? What Steve has done is helped me change a mindset. And I think he's changed, helped me change a mindset from a guy that wants to create a job for himself to a guy that wants to create a sustained business and something that can perpetuate beyond me. And I think sometimes when you're a leader, sometimes um, you think about the fact that, as somebody said, this business was, it was difficult to distinguish the business from Eric. And that gets back to the ego thing. But at the same time, do I really want to have the burden of this as being Eric slash logistics, or do I want this to be, this is logistics worldwide, a fantastic company, it has a great team, and by the way, it's got a good leader. In essence, what he's done is helped me step from the person who's running a sole proprietorship, forget the fact we're a C corporation, to actually the leader of what I believe is a developing business that can grow, quite frankly, beyond me. And I don't want to get too wishy-washy about it, but at the end of the day, I think I'm a different person. And, you know, and what Steve said is before your business can change, you have to change. Because at the end of the day, if you are the leader, you're the one that has to make the changes. You're the one that has to make the hard decisions. You're the one that has to sacrifice. But at the same time, you and the rest of the team can reap the benefits if you step through the process and you and you are dedicated to it. Does that that make sense? Absolutely. What would you say is um, why is he such a great client, Steve? Uh, <clears throat> Eric, and believe me, if I could get another 12 or 15 people <laughs> just like him, my, my job would be infinitely more satisfying. Uh, what Eric brings to the party is a willingness to want to improve. Um, he's one of the uh, few that I have that he takes control of everything. Uh, every time we have a call, um, I get an agenda from him. These are the things I want to discuss. These are the things that we talked about last time that we need to follow up on. Uh, he has completely embraced responsibility for his own development. And when you get people like that, sure, you have to get in and, and help them with the guidance and the awareness and exactly what areas to spend the time on and focus on. But when you have a client that is going to take that much responsibility for moving themselves forward, not only is it is more pleasurable for me, but the, the pace at which he moves is much greater, absolutely much greater. So that's, that's the single thing that I think makes this a great relationship. How does someone get in touch with you, Steve? to get started if they need your help? Um, they can call me. Uh, I love talking to people directly on the phone. It gives me an opportunity to kind of find out who, who they are. And uh, my number is 949-951-9163. Uh, they can go to my website, which is growthsourcecoaching.com, and my email address and my phone number are on there, so I'm completely transparent about how to get a hold of me. Uh, you can even go to LinkedIn, and you can, um, uh, you can find me there. But... Don't just type in Steve Smith because there's like 50,000 of those guys. So you have to put in Steve Smith Business Coach and then you'll get me. And you can connect with me that way if you want to. You know, Everybody has a, a kind of a different comfort zone about how direct they want to be. And I try to make a number of trails out there that people can pick and choose if they want to contact me. And if they do, uh, we, we can set up a time where we can just chat on the phone. I, I, I'll give any, anybody about 30 minutes to figure out what they're trying to achieve and whether I'm actually the right person for them. I'm not always that right person. Like Eric, I will find it will work with them uh, and be a better solution for them. But if it does turn out to be a match, at least they get a, to kind of a free opportunity to figure out how I work, and then they can make Absolutely. that decision for their own for their own self. Well, that's great. Well, um, Steve, I want to say thank you for putting these on. You it's been very it's been great. And Eric, for your time today, thank you for sharing so much great thank information. You. Hopefully, some of the audience can. You know, relate to your story and kind of see how you made some of those breakthroughs so they can, too, go forth and grow their business and to, to have purpose, which I believe you have much more now with the vision that you have and the opportunity you have with your business. Yes, I do. I'm very fortunate. I've, Steve, is, it, just as always, I've really enjoyed it. It's continued. We, our relationship will continue for as long as, as he's willing to, <laughs> to be part of mine. So, um, uh, But thank you, too, Frank. You've been, I appreciate the, what you've done, and I'm, I'm glad you hopefully somebody can maybe relate to some of the struggles that we've had and, and, and as we go forward. And just to say that we've moved this far doesn't mean we st still don't have struggles. It's just now I know that when we have a struggle, we take a look at it and we approach it logically, and we just move forward. Great. Well, we'll go to end that there, and then I plan, we plan, I believe, on doing these in the future, and you can subscribe to Google Plus uh, for uh, Steve's business, 
And you can also follow him on his blog, and all those links we'll have in the comments here after the Hangout if you wish to follow us there. Until then, we're going to go ahead and sign off. Thanks, everybody.